what happens here in this one. We are all set for game two. Immortals and Team Envy have switched sides. And it is our second game of 7.15 in North America. Envy clearly do prioritize Zac. They first picked it in the previous game. They first banned it here in this one. As we had seen, Immortals were happy to give it away. And they did win the game. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. And they did win the game, Immortals, so maybe they were right to throw out Hazak the way it was. It's all remaining to be seen as they still are respecting Lyra's Elise, and they still remove the Callisto. Yeah, and good to be able to take away the LeBlanc. That's really the only change for Immortals' first phase ban. The Maokai is going to be left up, and you would expect it to be taken mm -hmm. as that first pick. Let's see if Immortals does elect to go for it. I think, especially with the fact that it can go jungle and top, yeah. even if you want Cho'Gath, I still would feel like now, picking the Maokai first makes more sense. I agree. In 7.15 especially, I think in 14 it's debatable because Cho'Gath is more powerful, but actually they would rather... The champion they got to last pick in the first game, they are first picking here with a lot left on the table. This is something I believe we were seeing actually FlyQuest do last week, which I disagreed with quite a bit then, and I still disagree with it quite a bit now. I just don't think that J4 needs to be that high of a priority. Most teams will not early pick it, and you can pick it later on, whereas some of the contested picks are often grabbed up very quickly, but strange to see Maokai not in any of the first three picks yeah. of the draft or in any of the first six bands. Totally agree. It's interesting to me, but it's what they've picked up for themselves. Envy managed to take away the Tristana, though Immortals may be happy to put Cody Sun on the Kog'Ma, and they will. So a very long-range, high-damage marksman here for both the bot laners. A safer one, though, is on Apollo certainly is. They do have the opportunity to draft one of these very defensive supports that we've seen the rise in popularity of things like Janna, even Sona and champions like that, and mm -hmm. maybe a way they want to go with this hyper carry cog. Yeah, we'll see what it actually comes through as. Right now, Tali is going to be picked up for Po Belzer. So again, it's going to be the second time in a row that both Flame and Pulitzer are playing the same champion here in this one. And we'll see what team everyone wants to do to counter pick. All the mid laners are basically up right now, and Syndra will be coming through, you expect. His most played of the split. This would be game number eight on it for Niski, and yes, it will be. And especially because in that 1v1, you're expecting the Syndra to have the advantage over Talia. Yes, Talia can push in, but it is a non-combat ultimate. Talia, generally speaking, needs to get stuff done elsewhere on the map, where Syndra does have some decent roaming, not as strong as Talia, but is a monster in that 1v1 matchup. And if Syndra gets ahead, it becomes exceptionally hard for Talia to even get in range to really kind of get involved in these fights without getting zeroed out. That's the case here. So things to watch out for. We'll see what kind of shielding can come through to keep them alive. Of course, we know Flame could be building a locket and a stone plate and keeping some of the shields up. We also have to remember that this could be a jungle Jarvan. Yes, yes, it is not nearly as common, but some teams are running it. So it is a flex pick, though you certainly expect it to be shown in the top lane. Absolutely agree here on this one, but Remains to be seen what happens. A Talon ban comes through for Immortal, which either means they've been scouting on Seraph or it's a throwaway, because of course we've seen that Cinder's been picked up for Niski. Uh, Talon Top has been good in solo queue, and again, if the scouting is there, then sure. Yeah, it is something that you see in solo queue from time to time, though I do think it is very punishable, and that's one of the reasons you never really see it come out in competitive. Uh, this is someone who can be dove very easily, who can struggle kind of to play that more defensive style that competitive often forces you to do. See what comes through as the picks and bans continue on to this one. And we wait to see what actually comes through. The Bard ban away from Ole, no surprise. Rumble off from Flame means they still think that Jarvan might go into the jungle role. One final ban for Immortals, and phase two of the picks begins. And to be fair, Rumble has been shown as a flex recently. Also, also yeah. So both of these could be a flex, so you can look at that as a ban on both roles. Mm -hmm. If you just think it's a strong pick in the draft, and especially because it is a strong pick against someone like the Gragas, assuming that is going to go top lane, which it appears it will not. All right, and then we going to blind pick themselves a tank slash lane bully top laner. Seraph here on the Gnar. I think it's a very strong champion in this metagame, which is all full of melee high durability top laners. That Maokai is still available if they want it, but of course, Gnar would be a great matchup, so maybe less likely. Maokai is actually pretty good into Gnar. Really? So, oh, okay. one, one of the things about that, and really all the melee matchups that are pretty good into Gnar, is the fact that you have to play somewhat aggressive for it to be a good matchup, mm. and that's what can be the limiting factor, I think, in pro play because if you're nervous about the jungler being there, but uh, Maokai actually trades pretty well into Gnar. When he's in mini, you can actually just hop onto him uh, with your Twisted Advance, okay. lock him down, and you're able to actually trade quite well and sometimes come out pretty favorably in that lane. And it looks like, of course, uh, Flame agrees with you here. Maokai still don't know if he's going top or the jungle role. Of course, Jarvan could be there regardless, but the Lulu does come through, as you mentioned. Seems like we're gonna play a high shielding support. Lulu gonna be the one picked up here to support the Kog'Maw. 
And of course, could look really good into the Syndra to shield the damage out. But as well, Blitzcrank going to be the pickup as well. And what a great matchup for Blitzcrank. Neither one can blink. Lulu and Kogma are prime targets for the rocket grab. And we know Tristana can belt out damage afterwards. Yeah, new, new move blocks, as you said. And you catch either one of these, they're probably going to get bursted down. These yeah. are very squishy champions. Certainly, there is a big front line. So later in the game, if this Kogma is very strong, then there's the Maokai in front, there's the Jarvan, they're shielded up by Lulu. It gets hard for Blitz. But in the laning phase, that's certainly somewhere you could focus, especially when you take into consideration the power of the early ganks coming out of Gragas with things like a Body Slam Flash. These early level ganks can be extremely powerful. Yep. And as you mentioned in the late game, yeah, the shields get stronger from Lulu and whatnot, but there's a lot of reliable CC on Envy with the Gragas and the Syndra who can easily layer their ease on top of the, the rocket grab and make sure that target stays put. So rocket grabs will be pretty relevant throughout this entire game, but we'll see if Cody Sun and Ole can get through the laning phase as a result. The coaches shake hands for what could be the last time all year. And of course, as many times they could meet, they could meet playoffs, they could meet regional qualifiers, they could meet at Worlds. Let's think big, why not? And Immortals and Team Envy gonna do battle here for the last match of the regular season. Game two, coming up soon with Immortals up game one. Already from the win, Jarvan and Maokai, top and jungle respectively. Definitely excited to see this one. And Envy has that explosive early game. Yeah. They have the ability to really try to turn this around on Immortals. Immortals, I think, is the team that wants to play more passively, that wants to scale up to get their Kog'Maw, their Maokai, this really strong five-man unit to the point where they can take over in team fights. And here we go. Game two has begun. The base gates drop. And Ole going to zip his way over to the bot lane. Star Guardian Lulu, thanks very much. It's nice that they all fan out very beautifully. I think I want every champion to be a little bit like Arcade Hecker, where they've got like that rainbow trail. <laughs> so you can kind of like, you, they can all like, uh, like they're in Tron, just like Follow draw me. something. Right, but they, they, you can draw something on the map as you <laughs> as you walk out. Um, I think that'd be cute. Ooh. Just just for the first five minutes, you know, 15 seconds or whatever. This is actually something nice try. you'll see from time to time looking for that grab. But also, I have seen the play to try to counteract these teams going for the super leash. Sometimes Blitz will actually ward over that wall and then wait and see if the bot lane takes a greedy path, then back to bot. And mm -hmm. if you hook them in, you can essentially guarantee that they'll have to flash. Yeah, exactly. And you get a summon a spell lead, and Gragas shows up at level three and you kill him. It's beautiful. Ooh, I love this. Cody Sun went Storm Raiders Kogma. I see no one run this keystone. I thought it's been the best on COG for so long because it's so easy to trigger the, the effect to do, you know, 20% of someone's health. 20% health damage is super free. And you have insane move speed to kite everyone with. And everyone's always gone fervor for damage output or warlords for the lane safety. But I super love Storm Raiders COG. I think it's the great choice. I think it's great. And I'm glad Cody Sun's bringing it. So one of the, the reasons I think some people don't go it is because it's, generally speaking, a lot weaker in lane, right? And, it, and when you are playing kind of one of those hyperscaling champions, it mm -hmm. can be tough uh, if you are getting poked out, if you are getting bullied. And yeah, and then that can be one thing that you want to try to help to mitigate with something like the Warlord's Love. Yeah, it's interesting because you're right. Like, if you're getting bullied, yes, you want actual stats. There's no, like, direct combat stats that are granted there. But that was almost really cute. They almost got expected to keep the leash on the Raptors, smite the red, and then walk back. So they almost had an optimization there. But Kogma does so much auto attack damage. If you ever win the trade, the movement speed means you get three more autos off and then smash the trade. And as long as your shielding support is better than the hook, you can do that all the time. And here we can see he hits a follow a couple times. One more hit will give him move speed. Yeah, and if he got one more auto attack, he'd get like two more autos as a result. It certainly can be very powerful if you can play it aggressively. And we'll it is how well he is going to be able to utilize it. That's certainly something that can be very, very strong. You can see. Smithy with his super leash, already level three, already hitting up topside. They are going to go for this gank. They have such strong gank assist. They hit the knock up. Here comes Maokai. Seraph's going to become Mega Nar here. And this one's going to land the stun, but now he's got not a lot of spells left. Smithy, what's he going to find? There's a sapling. Gets pulled into the turret with the flash, but knocks him right back in. Do they have the damage? Is the question. One more Q, the auto. It's not going to be enough. There we go, Smithy, but he should maybe die for it. No, he's got just enough health. He's got to get away from the minions, and he will do so. First blood to Smithy. The top lane gank pays off. Such a good path here from Smithy. Utilizing the super leash to get up to topside extremely quickly. Gragas is coming up here, so Flame will have to be a bit careful as Smithy needs to back off. And Flame is flashless. Is he body some flashless? No, he's not. All right, recall back. And of course, spoils of war going to him. 200 gold. Actually, not quite that for the assist, but that's going to be nice for Flame as a... Uh, the only pickup for Seraph is a refillable potion and control board. Flame should get some real stats. Oh, look at that at Aniski. Yeah. Ow. Even more ow. Jeez. Well, Welter does have some potions, so we'll be able to regen up, but big trade there from Aniski is going to help him to establish that lane advantage. And Lyra is staying around. 
They're trying to see if they can set something up here, but I think a dive like this would be extremely risky, although Niski is making the move up too. We'll see if Smithy has smelled this out because he is quickly trying to get up to the top side and could turn this around. One. Can he make the out play against the Naga? Body Slam's gonna stop, it's gonna miss the stun, but Flame is still out of health. The auto comes through and Niski is gonna make the risky pay off. And that's a nice kill in the top lane. Really good roam there from Niski. And that's thanks in part to the great trade he got. He gets lane dominance in the mid lane. He utilizes that to get up to the top side and turn around what was a losing lane. Really beautiful stuff out of this one. Flame, yeah, greeted for a late recall. And that's the punishment right there. And he's going, going to go double longsword as well. So the repeat gank certainly is possible. No summoners were used by Envy in that dive. So uh, round two should be just as easy. It's certainly the case, but... We'll see if they actually get the opportunity to go for it as Pobelter does have the push now. He is closer to level six and Talia can certainly be another one to make those threats of roams. The three-man play topside would be strong for mortals, but here is the first blood set up once again. I do think that Flame went pretty early and this was certainly not executed that well from Immortals because as Smithy comes in, look how long it is till Flame actually is able to really follow up on the damage. Only gets the one auto off during that full CC combo and then Smithy realizing he needed to stay around for one more auto. They do get the first blood though and that is well done. Now Envy making the response play. Nissi's up here faster. They have the three-man setup. You can see Seraph takes aggro, takes as many shots as he can, then utilizes his jump to get out. So very well managed dive there from Envy to follow up. Absolutely agree. Great stuff out of this team. And it's obviously a much closer game than the first one was. Obviously that one snowballed very heavily off of a ill-fated blue buff invade that was just kind of unlucky at a certain point. This one much closer and Envy can claw back in this series. Top lane are equal in farm right now. Relatively equal items as well. Probably looking for a bit of uh, action down in the jungle. Not going to find it. Going to walk back to lane soon enough. Temporary minion lead for Cody's side, but Apollo can join that soon. Smithy stole 10 gold from Pobelter, I believe. Oh, yeah, Apollo going to go to farm. Either way, for Cody. things certainly stabilizing here. As Pobelter has reached level 6, Nissi's going to get there pretty soon. Pobelter would love to get the shove. He can get control of this lane to try to set up a roam. And Nissi already threatening that roam. May go straight up. They could look to repeat this dive as Seraph is getting close to 6. And you saw that Flame was actually backing off until they saw Nissi show once again mm -hmm. in that mid lane. Yeah, Nissi even has that control ward now on that top side of the lane. So it's definitely going to be difficult ahead for the rest of the team to survive all of this. And we'll wait to see what, actually, what else comes in. Still sitting on that 300 gold difference. Seraph going to walk back in. And again, they're both kind of close to six, about halfway there. As Seraph making a pretty smart play, though, when you have the push there in top lane, you have the ability to go in and actually pop the jungle plant. So you use the Scryer's Bloom, check out top side of the jungle, drops a ward. He knows that Smithy uh, should be, like, clearing towards the bot side now because those are where the camps are, but they do spot him out anyway on the top side. So he is trying to force a gank. And, uh, all you have to do in a situation like this is simply back off because Smithy has no camps to actually farm. So your jungler should be getting more of an advantage as the camps are available for Lyra top side. Malkai's gonna have to walk all the way to bot. So we can find anything to happen. Nice little bit of damage. Oleg gets himself some gold credit, but knocked up. And here comes Apollo. Do they go for the rocket jump? No. A little bit afraid of getting jumped on by the Maokai. Trade of blows and Oleg goes positive in gold. Apollo gonna jump over the wall and now the chase is on maybe for Hakuo. Can they get the size of shove? You're gonna get a slow oh, good flow. Oh, shove's gonna force the flash. And that is good by Ole to set up the skill shot for Pobelter. Yeah, really nice glitter lance there from Ole. Pobelter can go right back to mid, so trading that ultimate out for the flash, always going to be a nice advantage there. Flame going pretty aggressive he here. Seraph's jump is down. Maybe he can force a flash, but the damage not quite going to be there. Seraph going to keep cutting away. Q's up in a second. Not in range to land it, though. There's a stun for Niski. Does he have the damage? No magic mantle for Pobelter makes him a little bit safer. Not going to dodge. Actually, is going to dodge all the skill shots. Would have survived anyway. Flame may kind of bait himself in, though, because he has Seraph quite low. And Lyra is actually pathing up here. And he does not know it, but is going to be able to back off anyway. Gonna find himself a red buff. So Lyra not going to find the gank for himself, but... Nice attempt. Immortals has stretched their goldie to 500, though. They are slowly but surely winning ahead in these in these uh, lanes right here. Plus four for Pelter and plus 10 for Cody's son is pretty reasonable. And I think you're going to be very happy as the team with the Maokai jungler to be even going around even, right? If Maokai yeah. is getting farm, I think that he is a lot more powerful on average than a Gragas. Yes, Gragas has very high playmaking ability, and if you can you know, knock in the Kog'Maw and immediately kill him with the Syndra, sure, you're going to be more valuable. But in your average fight, Maokai does so much with point-click CC. 
Speaks between a point and click. Oh, they get a point and click right there by the Tristana. And a shot comes through, though, for Cody Sun, chunking just the same amount down Apollo. Pretty much out of HP, no potions. He's just going to rely on Warlords, and very injured to make that difficult. Also has his heal still up, uh, which is something for them, but certainly it's it's pretty scary. I mean, he's getting chunked very low. If he gets tagged with this ultimate, yeah, there's the heal having wow. to be forced because of Cody Sun, but they are looking for the engage. Round there is down four. here. Hook not quite going to land. Barely, barely, barely. Mid. Clear is still light. Light. He's got the flash for the body. So I'm going to force the flash out of Cody's son. Does he go for the ulti? I think his mana is too low. And actually, oh, oh, going to flash away just regardless. I don't believe he's going to be hit by anything, but wanted away from Lyra, who I believe, again, couldn't cast the ulti. Yeah, Cody's son and Ole fighting them off in the 2v3. They do survive. Perhaps getting a bit too bold as they, as they did look like they might have been able to take that fight, but then having to bold both their summoners, still a pretty good trade as Lyra blows his flash for both the bot lane summoners. Could look to set up a return gank, especially if they want to try to utilize the TP from Seraph or try to make a play down there. You can look for those big plays into a first turret, which would be a good way into the game for them. Yeah, especially with the BF Switch on that thing can get knocked down so quickly. It's something to always play around if you can. Watch. Flame clear with minions to the top side of the map as the gold got back to closer in this one. And we're still waiting for the next major break uh, of developments here. That's something I'm kind of surprised we don't see more of in pro play, especially into these ranged matchups, like someone like Gnar, is yeah. getting an early Bramble Vest. I think it's actually extremely effective uh, for your laning and being able to take away not only just the health regen and, and the life steal, not that he has a ton of it, but also just the return damage is very, very big. And Maybe the person you want to hook in. Maybe not, but it might need some space on the Smithy down to half HP now. Body Hunt's gonna land. They just have the burst damage. It was all there. He hadn't gotten a lot of stats just yet. A great kill coming through. Smithy never flashed away. Ulti came in a bit too late. Nice pick up their Envy with the gold lead. A Drake there for them if they want it. Yeah, and a good roam from the Envy bot lane. Able to move up there and give them the confidence to actually take that play to go aggressively onto Smithy. So, be it just now finished the Cinder Hulk, but still relatively tanky. They get a kill anyway. Uh, we're gonna look for round two. Here's the haste. He wants Ole. Nice juke. And there's no flash. Not gonna get a range though. Ole still, of course, too quick on the Lulu. And now the trade comes back in. Cody's still gonna land a few auto attacks. Trigger Storm Raiders. Eh, not gonna go for much more. Earlier well, does show now, so they know he is around. And we'll see if Smithy can get anything done elsewhere on the map. Look at that. I'm curious what Cody's gonna buy, because. Reaper's Bow Dagger is not going to build on anything by itself. Just got to stats for now, building towards the room, I'm assuming. Nice little knock up right there. Flame wants in a bit more on a Seraph, going back and forth, and he's going to be slowed down, and the Hyper gets triggered, and Seraph going to get over the wall, but he's still got the dunk, and Flame goes right back out, but still, went into that trade nicely, and Seraph going to transform soon. Yeah, very well done there by Flame, and that is how you can win these matchups, and if you're able to play it aggressively, so when they spot Lyra on bot side, he can go aggressive and look for those trades, but. Fancy now the jungle feet. fight. Oh, they dodge all three of Nisky's skill shots. Well played by him. And the little cat chases them down, and they're losing some HP. Fig goes back in, but Seraph was mini Nar. He had no way of using the uh, abilities, and he really got the bad end of that trade, but he's going to be okay. But now Smithy wants in, and honestly, with a low health Nar, this could be a chance. Here comes the engage. Both are going to roam around as well, and there's no way out for Seraph. He's going to get shot down. And that's a lot of uh, free time in the top lane. Lyra's gonna walk into a bit of a 1v3. This not far apart, but they might have the damage. They still got plenty of cooldowns here for this one. The knockup is in. Here comes the ulti as well. The seismic shove, and yes, Lyra bites off way more than he can chew. That's a bit surprising based on the dragon, but the knockup is there. The hook is in. The ulti and a trade kill comes in. Nice by Hakuo. Roaming everywhere on the map. Yeah, good roam from Hakuo to clean up another kill on the back end of that fight, but still, it's certainly the Immortals' advantage, and now they're gonna look to pressure this turret very heavily and maybe even go for the dive. Nice by Apollo to clear away as many minions as he could. Takes a lot of uh, damage to the back side of that, though. Turret's gonna stay alive for one more wave. Next one, it might be enough, we'll see. Yeah, Blitzcrank is gonna be back down here, but here is the initial play. Seraph not having the leap because he used it aggressively and gonna be able to get cleaned up very, very quickly. You can see everyone kind of roaming up. Alira perhaps going too early on the play, though, as Hakuo is still on his way up and going to be able to get burst down pretty quickly. You know, as you pointed out, the junglers are, are not that tanky yet. Even though it is a Cinderhall Gregus, he does get burst down, but they are able to get a counter kill. And now on the bot side, the engage on Cody Sun, who gets the storm, made it for Moose, but he's chasing down to Hakuo. Look at the damage output there. There's no way out, and Flame is in the mix. And Apollo flashes, buys a few more seconds, but the auto attack's still going to be in range, gets the kill for Flame. 
Full of charge means not very much, but Seraph. Seraph has oh, ulti. Transforming. He's got the Mega Nar. Can he find what he wants? He's going to oh, win miss. with the Cataclysm out of Flame to buy a few more seconds. The knockup is in and Flame with the sickest of outplays gets the kill. And the chase now going to use on Alira. A three for zero that Immortals can do no wrong in. That was so sick from Flame. He actually anticipated the ultimate coming in. Flashes over top of Seraph's Mega Nar there. They're going to clean up another kill and maybe even get Lyra. Looking for the chase into this one, forcing him to flash away. And wow, three kills to flash, and that turret likely to go down as well. Immortals have now granted themselves a gigantic lead. Turret's going to go down. Gold shared among three of them. 3,000 gold up. Damn. Immortals is looking good yeah. in this game, and they are they're closing in on that playoff buy. And we're going to watch this one more time. The initiation here from Hakuo, but Ole there to kind of peel for his support. And you can see the damage getting traded back on Apollo very high. The TP was faster again from Flame. He gets in here and is going to be able to eventually clean up Apollo. And then track Seraph. They see the Meganar very high up there. They know he's going to be looking for the ultimate. And then Flame flashes forward, I believe, there. No, it was actually just the ult to avoid yeah. it. He'd already utilized the flash. So very nice stuff from him to be able to dodge out on that ultimate. And just really good anticipation yeah. of the play coming out from Seraph. Yeah, really, really nice stuff. It's good uh, out of him, of course. What's funny is Cataclysm can betray you because it's terrain, and Nar can use it even if he's not on your team. But it certainly worked out in the end for him, and Seraph Great time. missed his flash. Seraph is not able to get as much. It's been kind of the story of, of the TPs in, in both of these games is that Flame has been the faster one yeah. to kind of pull off the plays and getting in faster, being more effective, and generally outlaning his opponent. A Flame has certainly been having a very strong season for himself, and two levels up now on the Gnar, he's at a point where he can really start to take over. Oh, that hook was insane, though, and Cody's been us <laughs> down. Round of applause for Hakuho. That was pretty nasty. Hakuho working hard to keep Envy in this game. Certainly making some plays, has been involved in a lot of it, and that is obviously one of the advantages of playing with his Blitz. Flame, though, looking uh, to dive on Seraph. Poor Seraph just cannot get any breaks this game. Gonna land for one more Q. The Flash makes sure he lands his skill shots. At least he baited some summoners out, but the kill still comes through top lane. Turret likely to follow. Yeah, the turret's gonna fall down again. Seraph certainly cannot buy a break. These roams the top side have really been hurting him. He has not been able to make anything happen elsewhere on the map, and he is falling very, very far behind. As Immortals again feel like they are in near full control of this one. Aqua wants to play. He sees Smith. He hooks him in. Here's a knockup. Stun's gonna land. There's really no way out for him. He's gonna dodge a few skill shots and a nice wild run to buy some time. Now he's got to kite away. Do they have enough? Those close up cast. Gets him one more second. Do they have the next skill shot? Kills his flash. Five seconds on, ex on the uh, rocket grab, and there's no way in. So it's Smithy walking away. Nice support out of Ole. The playmaker support targets his teammate and makes him live. <laughs> A great press of the R button as Hakuo. And E. Sling and a miss there, either yep. way. Smithy is going to be able to survive and is starting to get more and more tanky as time goes on. The one little thing that perhaps could have actually changed the fight from Envy is the fact that they actually spread out during the Maokai Ultimate, so multiple people got rooted. If everyone is in a line, essentially only the first person actually gets rooted by that and then the other damage dealer can continue forward and perhaps clean up that kill. It's yeah. hard to say, but it's certainly something that you want to do. You want to essentially pick one path and everyone goes through it when you're fighting against that Maokai ultimate. Yeah, yeah, you, you can easily face tank for your teammates to make it a lot safer. Same with like Thresh Box and whatnot. But yeah. that's the way it was right here. So no more things picked up. 3,000 gold difference puts the mortals ahead. Maybe if they had one of those rainbow trails like the arcade, yeah. they wouldn't know where It'd to go. It'd be more obvious. I mean, just find Elixir of Iron, it gets <laughs> close. Uh, interesting by Cody Sun, he actually rushed a Wits End. Uh, I know he bought that uh, a while ago when he was up against his Syndra, but he bought it like third or fourth item. I don't actually know if it's better or worse than rushing Ruin King, because an MR shred early game certainly is meaningful. Uh, I just haven't seen this build before. Uh, it's interesting. I, I guess I'm... I think it's it's certainly... He's saying, okay, what is probably going to hit me in a team fight? Syndra. Well, Syndra, the Gragas diving, the Blitzcrank, you know, ultimate... Rocket grab, etc. This yeah. is all magic damage that would be used to burst him down, and he's hoping that the MR from this item is going to be enough to actually keep him alive in right. combination with his frontline and the shielding coming Same out. Same time, the you have life steal on Rune King, so I'm not sure if it's really the better tank item, but it's a choice he's made, and honestly, his team's winning by a lot. Nice hook on Ole, saves the ulti for himself, and that ward goes down. 
I mean, it's, it's tough to know. If you don't instantly die, then Blade of Dragoon King is the better kind of tanky item sure. because you're going to heal back up. But if you are dying right off the bat, or if you feel that that is the only way you will die, mm -hmm. is instantly getting burst down. I think it's a great buy, but here comes the ultimate from Smithy, and we're going to be Blends. pushing them back. Lands out of Niski. The other one was tanked up by Lyra, and it's a bit of damage to mid lane outer, but it's going to stay alive for here. Game still thing within 4,000 gold. It's a large lead, but one that Envy could come back from. Uh, it remains to be seen, though, if they can actually do so. A lot of it's going to come down to the Envy playmaking. It's a much more straightforward, easy-to-run composition, I feel, from Immortals. But if Lyra can find the right Body Slam Flash and find Looks a kill... Smart. Not quite, though. It's a good Flash to the Poe to stay alive. Yeah, or, uh, sorry, Cleanse into running. It's up to Lyra, and it's up to Hakuo. They need to find picks. If you find a pick, you get a big carry. Great, maybe you can win a team fight. Otherwise, expect Immortals to win every 5v5. Absolutely the case. We'll see if they can win this one here as they look to continue the siege in the mid lane. And even Poalt are now running back down to make sure it's going to be all right with them. Let's see if they can find for themselves. No other major item pickup so far. First Poalt are going to use the ultimate to actually zone them off, and they can look for a dive. They're all stuck. Flame wants in for the Cataclysm. They're going to take a big ulti, though, on the back side of it. And Apollo is able to free fire a trade of one for one. Nar for the Jarvan, but the chase continues on Alira. He's going to get knocked down. A double kill now for Cody's son. Cutting right back out, two for one to Immortals. And both the kills going over onto that Kog'Maw is big for Immortals. They are very healthy here too, for the most part. Gonna be able to stay around and look to continue this push. Yeah, why not? It's a 4v3, shouldn't be too hard. Expedia still wants to flank, gonna heal up by killing these wolves off. And the next road in is towards Niski. Tons of minions, there's a flash in. He's gonna get knocked up, but doesn't quite find the root because of a flash away, it looks like. And well, the charge won't quite go off the Maokai either, and that's going to be Cody's chasing really hard. And he's not quite going to get it, and now he's a bit alone. Heal and Flash using away from Niski, and he probably could have stayed for the turret, but he went for the kill and didn't get it. They're still going to stay around, though, it looks like. Going to continue for this push. We'll see if they can get it on this third try. Niski is relatively low, but you can see Hako in the area, and Seraph and Lyra on their way back. All right, and the Yowder turret's going to go down 4-0 to zero in turrets and Immortals. Have all the lanes pushed as well. They've got a lot of safety to push back in with to recall and reset. And so they're going to kind of lick the wounds and get some minions, but 0, 5, and 2, obviously not a great scoreline. Definitely not where he wants to be right now. See Smithy going for Knight's Vow once again, as he did last game on the Rek'Sai. I love the early itemization of this to try to counteract some of the bursts from the teammates. But you can see Immortals looking to set up the dive again. Nice to Leo Wall here from Pobelter. They go right in. Look at Flame actually using the ultimate and fuse the rocket grab there. They're going to be able to pull off the dive. Hakuo having to flash out a lot of summoners used in retreat, but they are able to push forward, get two kills, and then get the eventual turret kill as well. Mm -hmm. It's 5.2 thousand. Now Flame wants to kill him. Two level difference. Hates him with some lightning, he's fine. And they have no vision on the top side. It would be very risky to actually go for. As you can see, Envy has fought back in the vision control quite well, and there's no wards whatsoever from Immortals up there. Where they do have control, though, is on the blue side of Envy, and that's why they are actually over here looking for the push. You can see that Cody Sun is shoving it up, and if Seraph stays around, he's going to get dove. And it's very, very tough to actually survive, I think, against this Lulu, Maokai, Kogma combo. So MB sees this, they're going to try to bring their own members over and try to defend. Here for themselves, because the attack onto the turret, and the wall locks them off, so Seraph could jump, but no easy way up for Akimo. Two going to get snagged up by the root, the seismic shove in as well. They don't quite have the kill just yet, but Seraph at the front line is not tanky enough. Goes down to Pobalt, and now Lyra not going to find his way in either. Rick Smithy low on the front lines, but staying healthy. One for zero so far. Immortals likely to keep the siege going. Yeah, good peeling there from Smithy. Just locks up Seraph on the Meganar, not allowing him in to find that big ultimate. And now Immortals going to continue to push. They're actually looking for the dive. Flame is TPing in from behind. He's going to find the mid laner. Niski is not long for the world. The ultis are across, and Cody's then getting the kill. A spree for him on the Kog'Maw. Four, one, and three in this game. Bot lane, two, two, false. Well, make that now two turrets plus, sorry, two kills plus a turret in the bot lane. Very smart dive from Immortals. They track the summoners out of Envy. They know that Niski he has no flash and no way out of that cataclysm. So very easy setup. And again, Flame really on point with his teleports. Has been able to get a lot for his team whenever he utilizes it. Baron also on the map. Ocean Dragon coming up. So there are some of those neutral objectives that Immortals can look to pressure around and perhaps try to bring Envy into a disadvantageous fight. They can find the next one here for themselves. Cody's actually going to forsake all life steal. It's going to be Rage Blade third item. So, I mean, it's the highest damage item you could go for here. So, respect the uh, aggression out of this one. But now he's going for high DPS and less so for the tanky stats. Titanic and Cleaver done for Flame. He's huge. As you mentioned, the Knight's Vow is already done for Expansion. So he's in a great spot. 
And Pogues onto his next item, probably the Void Staff here. As Cody's son takes no Ocean Drake, does he can take damage. And it's one of those situations where he's showing faith in his team to actually keep him safe. Because he has the Lulu, because he has the front line. If your team is initiating, it's so hard for Envy to actually pull anything off. Because once Maokai and everyone is oh, in their faces, we're going to see another kill. Flashes Ignite is on! One more tick gets him anyway, and Ole gets the kill credit. Once that front line is already up there, it's so hard for Blitz or for Gragas to actually get around and find an angle to pull in cody Sun. And even if they do, who's going to be there to follow up? Well, maybe no one here. The wall cuts off Haku for a little while. It's a three versus five in the turret, but nothing to be had just yet. Flame's still pushing in the bot lane. Baron is up if they want it. And someone has to answer Flame, and when they do, they could look to threaten the Baron, but that being said, Seraph has his teleport where Flame does not, so that is one advantage that MB can try to work around. Let's see if that happen then, but it's really unlikely the gold difference getting larger and larger. At a certain point, you just win a 4v5 of your Immortals. You've got level leads in almost all the roles. Two for Poelter in the mid lane, two in the top lane, and one in the support role. Immortals on this one average level lead over all. I really do like the here. setup from yeah. Immortals here. They've fully established division control now. It's so hard for Envy to actually check in, and they're going to be able to burn this down very quick with the Mountain Dragon plus the super high DPS coming out of Cody Sun. So it's going to be essentially an uncontested Baron. I think it's gone before Lyra can even get here. No one's even in range, not even looking for it. They're too afraid. Explosive oh. cast was close, but it's been going to land the smite just in time. Lyra. A beautiful attempt and valiant to be sure, but couldn't make it happen. But they get rewarded for their set of Immortals again, playing an extremely clean game here. And series overall, and as these item completions are coming in off of that Baron kill, uh, they are just getting stronger and stronger. You can see Leandri is completed for Pobelter. The Arden Sensor now finally done for Olay, which is a big damage spike actually for Cody Sun and you know, keeps him even more safe. And it's going to be even easier as they got this Baron buff on and everyone's healthy and Yep, just play around Cody's son, and they managed to get their team fights going the way they wanted to. Mid lane 2-2 two, two under fire, the only turret outside the base left available. The portals look to look for the poke. Lee Andrews is, of course, done for Pobalter, makes that pretty easy. They're just waiting for the next little moment where they can get their kills. I mean, there certainly is potential to actually end the game on this Baron with how strong Immortals is and how good their diving is. Yeah. Envy will have to play it very carefully, but even if Envy can hold on and can maintain, there are some extremely big items coming up soon for Immortals with the Rage Blade and the Double Stone Plates and these items, which would then give Immortals another window to try to end in a couple minutes. What do you think is going to happen here right here? Seven kill lead and 10,000 gold now. Mid lane and Hibbert are going to fall rapidly. Flame reads out of the Aerith Aerith looking. Save. It is the Meganar window to look around and they're not going to find anything for it yet. Still has that nice large leap range, but might not matter. Lyra waiting in the wings, goes to the base gate, looks for the flank, not yet gonna find it. Here's the engage on towards the support. It's gonna be Hako taking damage, flash away, they'll stay safe. Meganar hits the back line, but no one's there to hit Cody Sun. Flame stays alive, and the front line's going down already. Seraph drops, and two important roots come through out of the back line as well. Now the chase is on towards Apollo, who's got a flash to stay safe. Lyra pulled back in by Seismic Shove, has to body slam away as well. And now Niski is low, but no chase yet for Bowlter. Dodged away from the hook, and now Hako is slowed by the carpet. The Seismic Shove's gonna land, there's the kill picked up, credit to Bowlter. And he deserves it all the same. 14 to 5 in kills. This should be the 2 0 in under an hour of total game time. Pobelter leading the charge. He cuts off half the team. Niski can't join the fight, but the minions are dropping away as Lyra smites and the attacks come through for Apollo. A few more seconds bot right now for Envy. Next wave coming in. Look for the next fight. Flash to chase. He's going to kill off Niski to Apollo. And Cody's son. Cody's going to fight over the double kill now. And a Lyra for the third. He's going to run towards the fountain, but the attacks are there. He almost knocks him down, but he barely stays alive. But there's only the one member. Now two left alive as Seraph respawns. And this should be the turret falling all the same. And Flame and Smithy are already back, so that is going to be that. Immortals will secure their playoff by here. And the hook's not going to land, and Cody Sun keeps wanting to battle. He wants a CS score, that S+. Plus. He wants the token to show that he is Mastery 7 on Kogma here on this. As Lyra <laughs> running away, getting one more death in the column. Sadly for him, 2-3-2 two, and two on the Kogma. The next is going to fall. 27-30, Immortals going to secure the playoff by Envy, going to end the regular season in sixth with a 2-0 victory for Immortals. What a season it has been for Immortals, looking extremely dominant here today against Envy. And one of those other playoff teams, this is exactly what you want to see from your top teams and the kind of form that everyone is going to be striving to reach going into playoffs. Absolutely agree. Beautiful step out of this squad. He's really managing to out damage everyone except for Niski. He even did more than Apollo in this game. And that's a Maokai jungle for you right there. Handshake's cheap. Through. Yeah, he's certainly very good. And 
And again, two 30-minute victories, sub-30, I believe, for Immortals. Really great stuff. The strange thing again, though, is, is Maokai certainly could have been taken by Envy. Right? Yeah. The fact that Lyra is choosing to play Gragas over Maokai is and problematic Seraph to me. Is not Seraph, Seraph as, well. as well, right? So this is a champion that is so exceptionally strong. You need to be able to adapt and play these champions when they are at this supremely powerful level. And if you cannot, you will be punished for that. I think that in both games, the, the draft was kind of easier to execute, stronger for Immortals. Mm -hmm. it, there's not a lot they, they have to do to actually execute in a 5v5 if Envy cannot find you know a grab or an ultimate in on one of their carries. And, Yep. Immortals never gave them those opportunities. Played a very clean game. Yeah, there were very few opportunities. There were a couple of really nice hooks out of Hakuo, and mm -hmm. some where it was a nice hook, but it was turned around anyway. Yep. Uh, but certainly, yeah, this this felt like a slightly less severe version of the first game. First one was a four for one at six minutes, and then just okay, well, they just kept snowballing. This one at least competitive until ultimates, and you know some nice dives came out of Envy. They had the they had the glimpses there, but they clearly looked outmatched. And that's what it comes down to. Is Immortals certainly looked like the better team on the day. They have one more match to play as Immortals, and uh, their, their destiny may still be out of their hands at, you know, coming into the week, TSM has a better game record. Mm -hmm. So if Immortals 4 O's, but TSM 4 O's, sorry, buddy, but TSM's first place, uh, the head-to-head -head will be broken just via overall game percentage. Uh, but Immortals uh, may be becoming uh, CLG's biggest fans yeah, going into be, Sunday. As, could very as much. That one could push them into first place if yep. they're able to obviously complete their 2-0 weekend. Absolutely the case. So it's going to be fun to watch for. Of course, we'll have an interview with Immortals very soon on this, and and it comes down to Immortals, they know they're going to have that, those two weeks off because week 10, as it would be, would be the promotion tournament, and then the next week would be the quarterfinals. So they have one rush to play, two weeks to look at 716 and be ready for it, and then get their matches going. And that's going to be the run. This could be the one that Immortals finally makes the deep run in the playoffs. But for more on how they did secure that playoff buy, let's check in with Degon and their triumphant jungler. Thank you very much, guys. Great cast. Uh, thank you uh, for joining me for this interview, Smithy, because that was a very, very short game. Please give me a little bit more time here. Talk to me about that series. Um, well, today was like a pretty fluid communication for everyone. Um, everyone was just like in their comfort zone. And then, yeah, everyone played really well in my team. Yeah, so we got to hear you and your comms a little bit during after the first game. What ability, how do you go ahead and bring out the ability to predict where the other junglers are and communicate that to your team constantly? Um, well, I can just, I guess you can chalk it off to like just mainly experience um, where like it, vision is pretty much important, but sometimes you can predict if you have just like a little bit of vision and then there's not much routes junglers can do because like there's only two quadrants for every team and yeah, like we just predicted the right way. This season has been culminated with a bunch of big time moves, including your trade with Dardock earlier in the season. You've inserted yourself here as a leader on the team. How does it feel to be in the talks of MVP? Um, I don't really call myself an M like mainly MVP. I'm just for my team. Um, they just wanted mainly like just like a sh sort of like a shot caller slash like a bigger voice for everyone, and then everyone just contributed like equally, and pretty much like. Um, made this like a really good team. So I'm not gonna give you the fluff question of how do you think the season's gonna end? We know that Immortals, your Immortals' goal is to be champs of NA. How do you make that happen? Um, just playing uh, like we do, um, make our scrims more productive, post game more productive. And that's the only thing that we're lacking right now is just like consistency in scrims. And we're thoroughly fixing it uh, like day by day. All right, well, thank you very much, Smithy. Hit him with an eyebrow as we go ahead and send it on over to Dash and Chad. I love it. Thank you very much, D Gon. One of the work? fastest. I've never even seen the X with the eyebrow. <laughs> we just suddenly pulled it out. All right, yeah, hey, good. Why not? Um, one of the fastest series we've had all split. Yeah. Around, uh, what was it, 51 23? Yeah, total that's game what time? I heard. Oh my goodness, blazing fast out of Immortals. That, yeah, we've actually seen games go longer than that, well, longer than that. Immortals hot out here in week nine mm -hmm. and right there at the end the question around mvp i do i want to touch on that just real briefly because i think there's so much conversation around mm -hmm. you know jensen and bjergsen as there always is and these big ticket players in the mid lane and whatnot even lira in the jungle and things like that yeah we have to remember 
that with two changes on the Immortals organization, Coach and Nick Smithy coming into summer, they've gone from a seventh place team, now yeah. have secured their playoff bye. Not yet sure whether or not their first or second seed, but it's secured a playoff bye moving into the summer finals. That is a huge trajectory. It adds so much to his resume for yeah. MVP. And he doesn't need to go out and declare himself MVP for people to make him a real candidate because, as you mentioned, any type of rapid improvement like that from seventh to first, even if there was also a change in the coaching staff mm -hmm. is huge. Steve Nash won the MVP twice in a row because he took a bunch of journeyman players and gave them 50 to 60 wins in the regular season. A couple yeah. years ago a in the NBA. A reference that may be fans, four people out there. Google Steve Nash. He won the MVP twice because he had a lot of assists. An amazing player. Yeah. Phoenix Suns. Love it. All right, now to the game at hand. Uh, the only champion select thing I want to hit on is the Kog'Maw, and more specifically, the Kog'Maw, the way it was built. We had Storm Raider Surge picked up, and then a Witsend first item. Break it down for me why you like that build so much in combo with what else was happening on this team. Yeah, this is pretty cool. So a lot of the power spikes that teams are trying to hit in this meta is an 80 carry on two items with a Knight's Vow tank jungler and an Ardent Sensor support, because then there's two direct items that buff up the carry who's already hitting a big power spike. The Witsend is cool in this situation because it has magic damage on hit, Cog does more magic damage than most, it also has magic damage shred, and then Art and Sensor also adds magic damage. So you call it 80 carry, he's doing mostly magic damage with that build, right. and then it has the added defenses of defending against Syndra, and you think you're gonna get a damage hit, but we really didn't see that there. Because of all the extra magic damage sources, he was then amplifying with the shred, so right. I thought it was pretty cool. That's just the wit's end. Then we take yeah. into account, as Freak was mentioning, well, that requires you to move away from the Blade of the Rune King, somewhere that you might mm -hmm. find some lifesteal, be able to you know, persist in fights. Well, guess what? Yeah. They had a solution for that, too. Yeah, Stoneborn Pact on the Maokai, which scales off of max health, mm -hmm. is gonna give him around 100 health every two seconds when he's auto-attacking a champion that Maokai has recently CC'd. And then the Ardent Sensor is giving him about 30 to 40 health on hit depending on the level. So right. he's gonna sustain in team fights with his lifesteal. And then he built a Rune Ends. And then he built the Rune Ends Hurricane. If he would have completed it, it would right. have doubled the on hits from the Ardent Sensor as well as the Wits End to shred faster. I mean, so, so that to cool me stuff. just is a very well thought out draft. And if we were going to throw criticism to casters, we're talking about it foregoing the Maokai pick for Agragas. We can get into that. We know that yeah. Maokai is a very strong pick. But this game, very much like the first one, it was close for a short period of time. And then it blew wide open. It all happened in the bot lane this time around. 1330 into the game. Let's take a look. Flame, yeah. oh my God, in this replay. Hey, this was 10 minutes after the first game was decided, but starting it off well with the hook on a Cody Sun, just can't quite burst through the Lulu, and then it becomes about team play. Flame teleports in first, Cody Sun finishes off the kill, and then from here, you're worried about Sarah, because yes, it's going to be in favor of, end of Immortals, but you think Flame is gonna die, until he times his Cataclysm to jump over Seraph, who then ults the air, because the timing of that was super precise. If yep. Flame ults late, he actually ends up closer to the wall, which allows him to get stunned by the Nar ultimate, right. but he timed it right before the leap. Because Seraph flashed for that ultimate. He had to yeah. predict the flash in order to get enough distance oh, away man. from the wall to not get hit by that. A complete outplay makes it a very lopsided skirmish because they could have traded some kills mm -hmm. back. It may have been a more even game and stuck in it. And then once again, you look at that gold graph with that lead, Immortals knows how to play this game. These guys dominated this series, more so than uh, most series we've seen mm -hmm. this year. And we keep talking about Envy, they are a playoff team. So whether or not Immortals is first or second seed, they're gonna get that by, and they're gonna take a lot of confidence in the playoff. Absolutely, Flame will pick up player of the game for that Jarvan play, of course. When you see a lopsided game like this, you could throw it to anybody, but it was mm -hmm. that replay there and his individual mechanics within it that definitely built them towards the lead or uh, that would eventually net them yeah. the victory. Outside of the game though, I wanna move past this series as a whole and I wanna take a look at what this means for the playoff picture. So we're gonna pull these standings mm -hmm. up for you real quick. As again, Immortals has locked down their playoff buy here. Taking a look at this, TSM still in the running there, as was mentioned. Immortals might be Counter Logic yeah. Gaming fans following this evening, hoping that they can secure the number one spot for them. Exactly, because the way the tiebreakers work is it's going to be match record, then head to head, which would be tied between them and TSM, mm -hmm. and then game record before you're actually going to play a tiebreaker game. So, based on the fact that TSM has four fewer game losses, Immortals would end up losing that tiebreaker unless TSM's match score is below them. And just amazing, Immortals is up here now. When last split, they were down here at number seven. Just again, have to keep calling them up the fact that they've grown so much. Right. And then my last question is when Immortals is playing games like this, 
How much can you really determine around Envy's power level? Because with two very early game instances, mm -hmm. the game went completely in Immortal's favor. And as we said, it's hard in some cases to really fault Envy, you know, because, yeah. hey, every once in a while, a, a fight doesn't go your way. Somebody yeah. does minorly outplay you. Does that mean you're that worse of a team that you then got stomped just because of the gold lead? I know. It's tough to judge Envy when they're dominated that hard, but it, it isn't a good sign for sure. Okay. Because Envy was 8-6 and six three matches ago, and we knew that every remaining game was against a team that was going to be above them in the standings. So the fact that they have now lost three games in a row against the types of teams they're going to be playing in playoffs is going to be worrisome for them. And that's the big thing, right? they got to turn around here this week. Maybe getting a win in their final match of the regular season might do a little bit in terms of boosting yeah. that morale and giving them the confidence they need to take victories here in the quarterfinals as that's where they will be playing. Now, don't go anywhere. We've got two playoff teams taking to the stage next. we got Team Dignitas against Counter Logic Gaming. When we return, we'll see you soon.